I see people who are moving in and out. We would love for you to come forward if possible. It's a very empty front row. It's a, sort of a ghost town in the front. If you feel like it, please come forward. It feels much friendlier if you're all right there. <laughs> they don't bite. Yeah, come on. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Excellent. <laughs> all right. It's all about accountability. All right. Yeah. Kia ora koto. My name is Raya King Wall, and it is my utmost pleasure to welcome you to this friendly debate today, um, organised by the Emerging Museum Professionals New Zealand Group. Uh, we're going to hear from each of these very good sports here on stage as they debate the moot point, are Aotearoa museums inclusive? I am in awe of our team members today, all of whom willingly and astoundingly without bribery agreed to get on stage this afternoon. Oh yeah. In classic debate format, we have three team members on each side of the issue. To my right, double checking that I've got this right, yep, to my right we have the affirmative team, i.e. yes, our museums around the country are inclusive. We have here Richard Bench from Arts Access Aotearoa, <coughs> Amiria Puya-Taylor, the people weaver, and Trafina Cracknell, uh, Hastings City Art Gallery. Woo! Woo! Yeah! To my left hand side, we have the negative team. So they will be arguing about some of the ways our museums aren't inclusive. Yeah. <laughs> Each team will take turns speaking. We'll start with the affirmative side and presenters will have five minutes each to give us their case, all without the aid of a comforting PowerPoint, which is very brave of them. So I'll be giving them a little heads up when they've got 60 seconds left to finish up their argument and then they will be cut off at five minutes on the dot and I've already been told I might be challenged on this so we'll see how that goes. Um, at the end we may have time for questions but we might not so no promises there. Um, but we will also be taking a vote from the audience as to which side you think is the winner. Um, we're going to measure this with the very unscientific way of who gets the loudest claps as determined by Raya? Um, so prepare your hands accordingly. I think that's probably all that we need to get covered before we get started. Oh, can you please identify the negative? Oh my words? goodness, what have I done? Terrible. So they've already lost. Unconscious bias? No. Um, <laughs> For sure. We have Naomi Megatroyd from Object Space, we've got Robin Hunt from Axes, yeah. and we have Mike Dickerson from the Whanganui Regional Museum. Yeah. Alright, I think that's all we need to cover then. Um, so let's begin, we'll be starting off with the affirmative side. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, kia ora tato. Museums in New Zealand Aotearoa are inclusive. This conference is an example of just how inclusivity is not just a theme, but a way of being. Colleagues, museums have been including objects and stories <laughs> and treasures so much within their walls the problem now is, having included so well, there's not any room to include 10% of our collections on public display. But no worries, everything that we cannot see is not excluded because it can be found in catalogue systems and databases. There is no homelessness in museums, for everything has a place. Everything is known about its utopia. It's safe. <laughs> the theme and discussions of this conference demonstrates how museums are indeed replacing the traditional bastions of religion and other institutions that inform people how to think. And it's the front of house people, staff 
and educators who are the new high priests of welcoming and diversity, making you know that this is a place where you will see your story unfold, maybe not this year, but maybe next year, as the EMPs move the mahi along. And in fact, colleagues, in fact, the rest of this country could take a leaf out of MA17 Museums of Inclusion's theme and do as you have all so well done as a cooperative, inclusive sector and take a long, hard, lingering, culturally appropriate, damn good look at itself. <laughs> because as the government currently wrestles with the shocking notion of including more people in our midst, as refugees and migrants, at an unprecedented time in the history of humanitarian need, and doubling the UN quota is being resisted at any cost. Here, before me, I see a sector of culture, art, and science representing representatives wanting more people, more diversity through its doors. What needs to happen, beloved colleagues, and to prove my point that museums are the finest and most excellent vanguard of inclusivity and always aware that 24% of New Zealanders have a disability is that this year when we have a general election is for Museums Aotearoa to become a political party. <laughs> In fact, all you need to do is change the name to Inclusions Altira, the voters will never know the difference. <laughs> and before long, Philippa Toka can be the next and most needed woman Prime Minister of Altira. <laughs> and Stella Duffy can leave the Ministry of Fun Palaces. <laughs> And the man from the Ministry of Culture and Heritage can immediately increase funding to the museum sector by 20%, and this will require no special application process, and no reports will need to be written on completion of the exhibitions. <laughs> but I digress. Museums Aotearoa are already a place of people. But where do we go on weekends when the sport is cancelled because of the rain? The shopping malls or the inclusive museums, which are always open and always so welcoming? What will we see under the new Inclusions Aotearoa political party? It will be, we will see free to enter museums everywhere and all directors will have completed and signed off on accessibility and inclusion policies at their governance levels, upholding the roles of the designers, the educators, the public programs leaders, the visitors hosts, and the precious, precious volunteers who fly the flag every day, drawing the people ever inward to their places where all the treasures of the 1850s meet the metadata of the 2017s and the stories of today together with the symptomatic emblems of nationhood acknowledge our bicultural inclusion for us all. Kia ora everybody, thank you for such a passionate argument that we are an inclusive sector and now I'm going to disagree with you and I'm going to talk about inclusivity in becoming one of us, a member working in the sector and I'm going to argue that the required qualifications and experience levels for entry level positions in the glam sector exclude people. The cost of living in New Zealand, combined with the cost of an education, means that a university degree is a privilege not afforded to all. First of all, I'm going to touch upon a study from America, which the lovely Emily Trent made me aware of yesterday, uh, which looked at popula population demographics within areas and whether or not the staff working in their museum and galleries reflected that. Unsurprisingly, it found that while the population was diverse, with a high proportion of black, Hispanic and other ethnicities, the museum and gallery staff simply did not reflect this and was mainly made up of what they term non-Hispanic white. They further identify that there isn't a youth bulge, 
So these uh, institutions have, um, they say they have diverse hiring practices and they say that they have uh, policies in place to ensure um, moving up, you know, there's going to be diverse leadership um, in, in their boards of management, but uh, they're mostly hiring from a pool of white people, so they had no one to promote. There's a lot more in this study which I sped read last night, <laughs> but one of their key conclusions is one that I think is very relevant to us here in Aotearoa, and that is that to ensure that museums have a diverse pool of people to hire from, then there need to be diverse educational pipelines into gallery and museum careers. Young people need to see how they can gain access to a job in this sector. So, back to New Zealand. Taking a broad scan of the MA job vacancy listings, I found that most entry level positions require a tertiary level qualification at least, if not postgraduate study as well. To attain a BA in New Zealand, you need roughly three years of study. Adding postgraduate qualifications to that, you've got another four, you know, four to six years total and the accompanying student loan. In my case, that's $68,000 for a BA and an MA. The cost of education alone in this country is a barrier of entry into this sector, as not everyone has the time and the money it takes to get the qualifications required. Cost of living, particularly in Auckland and Wellington, where two of our three museum studies programs are based, is also a major barrier to undertaking study. Both Victoria and Auckland University are releasing startling reports on the number of students who are unable to afford rent and basic necessities with a rise in financial hardship grants, students visiting food banks and people simply dropping out because they're unable to get by. Quite frankly, I could not do today what I did 10 years ago to enter the sector, studying full time and working roughly 20 hours a week to top up money for living costs. I happened to find out recently that a friend of mine has moved into my old flat, which hasn't been renovated, so good luck to them. <laughs> the rent has increased by about $50 per person per week, and the amount allocated to living costs from your student loan has increased by $3. The minimum wage has increased by roughly the same. It simply doesn't add up. I'm a middle class white chick, and if I would find it a struggle, what do people with significant financial and social barriers have to do to go to university? My guess is quite simply that they don't go. On top of the significant financial barriers to education, we add the seemingly compulsory requirement that in order to enter the glam sector, you must work for free. I really can't put it any better than Jessica Aiken did in her piece for Tusk. If internships and volunteering are mandatory for a career path in the sector, we are effectively shutting out a number of people. You have to be able to work for little or no money in order to take on an internship. Time for volunteering is a luxury not everyone can afford and this has a knock-on effect. Lack of diversity in volunteers leads to lack of diversity in staff. In short, high demands for formal qualifications coupled with the requirement that people intern or volunteer leads to significant barriers to entry into glam sector employment. As identified earlier, um, our paths into the sector need to broaden to reflect the needs of the diverse communities around us and to ensure that we are able to be inclusive internally. Thank you. sunshine on the dial. I want to share a little bit about why museums are so inclusive. It's so inclusive I'm not even in the sector anymore. <laughs> Number one, museums are so inclusive that I consider them the ninja training ground. The ninja training ground, it is so powerful and so much of a ninja training ground that people as emerging as I am, have learned how to be outspoken, heard, remembered and valid. Number two, museums are so inclusive that they provide some of the best professional development opportunities for students in full-time study wanting to build a career within the glam sector for themselves and are also willing to do it for free despite only being allowed to earn a whopping maximum of 20 hours worth of income to help feed themselves and pay their rent and pay for the bread and butter. <coughs> and that doesn't jeopardise their student allowance. 
stopping them from studying. Doesn't that so inclusive? <laughs> Museums are so inclusive. They offer a variety of job opportunities for those up-and-coming ninjas, those ass-kicking ninjas, who are keen to become holders of the amazing internships and curatorial ships, voluntary work, casual, fixed-term contracts, and of course, this definitely enables us to pay off our 50,000 plus um, student loans that get us our BAs, our honours and our masters. Let's not talk about the aspirations of getting our PhDs. Heck, where it will be become completely unaffordable to society, where we will possibly miss out on all of the teaching to inspire the future ninjas coming into the sector. How? If you work super hard just like me, with a lot of overtime and a lot of loud mouth extrovert just like me, you will most likely land yourself a part time or full time contract or jackpot permanent. Number four, museums are so inclusive that I have learnt more about my cultural heritage through this ninja training ground. That from a formal and social training marae and through villages, being in Samoa, Tahiti or the Cook Islands, from a non-museum expert such as my kuia and kaumatua. My inclusive rights as an emerging ninja in this field has given me the underground access to taonga by seeing them at arm's reach through glass cases. Unless, of course, one of my friends in collections gives me the access, gives me the G-pass, and enables me to have that direct intel. Again, this works when you're an extroverted loudmouth such as myself. Number five, museums are so inclusive that my newly developed ninja kicking ass abilities have enabled me to convert more potential ninjas and to see the value in what museums and the wider glam sector do, just by being an art ninja inside galleries, libraries, archives and museums, because we are the bloody future. In conclusion, Developing rationale as to why museums should be inclusive is actually totally irrelevant. It's not like we are the future leaders or the future ass kickers that possess an incredibly diverse and innate ninja knowledge from Jedi specialists of the underground tunnels of history, conservation, science, culture, arts, that would be totally absurd. As the Super Sensei Master Iokapeta Mangele Suamasi pointed out, let's not focus on social inclusion. Let's focus on social exclusion. Not so much the answers, but the questions that we need to continually ask over and over again. Mic drop. <laughs> friends, I can't really see you because it's so bright up here, but have you ever heard such a load of optimistic twaddle? <laughs> Unbounded optimism and delusions of grandeur. <laughs> and as for my traitorous colleague here, <laughs> however, he made reference to refugees, for example. How many refugees are here, unless you're refugees from something or another down in Wellington? But, they talk, um, so, so we've heard talk about policy, accessibility policy, disability policy, but policy schmolicy, it sits on the blooming shelf and gathers dust and no one gives a damn. It's what you do that counts people and it ain't been done. For example, who, how many, um, Disabled museum professionals do we have in New Zealand? Probably as many as you could count on the fingers of one hand. And what about senior managers at this conference coming to learn? I don't know how many there are. Don't bother to put your hands up because I can't see you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and here we go, all this rubbish they're talking. And Raya's very own research shows what low levels of access our museums have <laughs> in the widest sense. They don't even understand what access means. They think it's ramps and doorways and loos. And they don't even know where to put the signage for the loos. They stick it on the stairs. 
so. They think it's too expensive, too onerous, and like Richard Preble once said to me at a meeting, there are only three wheelchair users in Wellington anyway. <laughs> so it's too expensive, too much bother, and all those crips and blindies, they just get in the way and you trip over them and they touch things and they knock things over and they're just going to be a pest. And as for all those noisy people with learning disabilities, they're just an embarrassment. So, so they don't want them there, let's face it. And aesthetics are way more important than access. You've got to have them be really pretty. So, so, when people do think they're going to be a bit inclusive around disability, they do something here, they say, here's something, oh, we'll do this. And I know a blind person, so we'll get that person in and we'll just do a little tour with them and we'll, we'll just um, maybe put a ramp here and say that we've done it. And it's all good. Because um, we had three people here, we had one person here with a guide dog, and we had another person here who's autistic and likes art, so that was really good. And, um, and maybe I saw, saw somebody with a wheelchair last week, so we're really inclusive. Everybody's coming and having a look. Even though our stuff's in glass cases and you can't touch it and you can't get near enough to it and the light's crap. <sighs> Where do I start? <laughs> so... And the other thing that really gets me is that all those good, good stories that they're missing, because they're so focused on the big things of history, like wars and blokes <laughs> and like me, and all of those things, and yet there are some really good stories that they're missing. Even when they had a few injured blokes, they stuck them in a back room so that hardly anybody could see them. So. What are the stories that should be told? What are the subversive stories that should be told? They're not being told because they're subversive. So, but then... Oops. Technology, eh? It's a terrible thing. That's the other thing about museums. <laughs> they have all this lovely technology and they put up their videos and they're really lovely and they don't have any sign language and they don't have any captions and they don't have any audio description. So, what? 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Okay. So I haven't got a lot more to say really than that other than they're not inclusive and my dear friends here over here are sadly deluded. So, um... To be really inclusive, you're going to have to engage with us, the disabled people, the scary crips and blindies. Thank you. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa. When I first heard the MOOC point that Aotearoa museums are inclusive, I thought, how are we going to fight that? We've lost already. But then, over the course of the last two days, I've spent time talking to you all, delegates at this conference, and I realised that in actual fact, we could win this debate. <laughs> this morning, Sabine Doolin from the Tate shared a quote from Verna Myers about inclusivity. Diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusivity is being asked to dance. So I'm now going to start by sharing a series of quick examples in which Aotearoa museums have invited our diverse communities to dance with us. Starting with Te Manua, Noa Open Studio for Artists of All Abilities and Backgrounds has brought together established artists together with people with, who, who are picking up a paintbrush for the first time. Waikato Museum, spectrum friendly sessions for people with autism to experience exhibitions in a comfortable environment for them. Tairawhiti Museum, the exhibition Korongo Whakata leading the way in collaborative exhibition development with Tangata Whenua. The New Zealand Cricket Museum, a tactile tour for people with low vision or who are blind. Robin, on the 29th of May at the Wellington Cricket Museum, you can lay your hands on a bat. <laughs> <laughs> the Auckland Museum's PCAP project, drawing Pacific communities closer to the collections. Te Awaho Newstrom. Inclusion of the Dutch and Māori communities to working together to develop a, a new cultural centre. Moitat, a Waikato museum, developing science lexicons of te reo Māori. Dunedin, public art gallery, audio described in sign language tours. City Gallery Wellington, a welcome in sign language to all visitors. 
Now the negative team called on a bit of research to back up their quite flimsy moot. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some research too and it's all of you, our conference delegates. I'm now going to call on you to be our evidence base by asking you some questions. I'd like you to show your support or um, by just raising your hands please, don't be shy. First of all, does the institution that you work for have adequate ramps and lifts for accessibility for all? Does your institution, museum or art gallery offer labels and or content in te reo Māori? Does your institution offer language, uh, labels or content in another language other than English or Māori? Does your institution offer regular, interpreted, audio described um, or sign language tours for those in our community with low vision, who are blind or deaf? Show of hands please. Um, this is supposed to be our audience space, if we could just please have a show of hands. Uh, Aotearoa museums are employers that encourage diversity in the workplace. How many of us have a colleague with a disability? Okay. Who will be taking what we've learned here over the last three days and making changes in the institution to make Aotearoa museums more inclusive? On that note, the affirmative team rests our moot. And our <laughs> two museums are inclusive. Come down. Um, it's wonderful to be here and I love so much Trafina's idea of using the audience as evidence <laughs> that I think I'll copy it. <laughs> How many people here have a uh, university qualification primarily in science? How many of you have in your job, dis your job title curator or collection manager of natural sciences or natural history? Oh. That's not very many, is it? <laughs> Gosh, isn't that strange? I mean, let's talk about inclusivity of the museum sector, shall we? Because I'm a curator of natural history and I don't see too many of my colleagues here today. Now, of course, it's easy to argue uh, about a museum being inclusive or not because inclusive doesn't really mean anything that can mean what we want it to mean. It's like arguing whether a museum is nice or not. <laughs> and depending on however many examples you want to give, you can prove whatever you like. But I think the show of hands here says something interesting. So if we look at what our, our public, our audience, our um, sector stakeholders think is important in a museum, and people have done this, what do they want to see museums doing? What do they want in museums? They want whales, they want dinosaurs, <laughs> and they want spiders. Top three. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's nice. That says something about what our, you know, the people who's re responsible for serving want. Um, but when I see a museum trying to tackle a subject like whales, it tends to become a story about whaling. That is about how people kill whales. When they wanted to do an exhibit about eels, it becomes how do we kill eels? Here are some of the technologies we've developed to do it. And so the argument is always that a museum can't just talk about natural history, natural sciences. It has to embed it in a cultural context, because otherwise people are turned off. Well, someone should tell silly old David Attenborough he's been doing it wrong <laughs> all these years. So why do we have this unusual bias in our museum sector, this disconnect between the people in this room and the people out there? Well, if you go to our museum studies programs, as supposedly set the agenda for the sector, you read the fine print, you'll find they're actually not museum studies, they're culture and heritage organisation studies. Uh, why is that? Well, you know, I guess if you ask them, they would say, because that's the only kind of jobs that are offered in the sector are cultural heritage jobs, not natural sciences jobs. 
Oh, so why is that exactly? I just like these annoying three-year-olds that keep asking why. Um, well, the, only those jobs are offered because that's the sort of, of exhibitions that we do, and those are the sorts of collections that, that we create. And well, why do our institutions focus only on culture and heritage collections and exhibitions? Well, that's because that's the only sort of thing we acquire, and that's what's in our mission statement. Um, so it goes round and round in this way. But no one ever thinks to say, well, why do we do it that way? Because there are certainly a lot of institutions with huge natural sciences collections and many people in New Zealand who work on them, but they're not in this room. So why does our sector exclude them from this conversation? Um, of the over 100, 100 people presented at this conference, and there were precisely two presenting as curators of natural history, and one of them was 10. But wasn't she awesome? <laughs> she was awesome. Yes, but that's just, that's not many. I think you'll agree. So I'm always puzzled as to why, and this is, this is, this is a wonderful spectacle you're watching. You're watching a white, middle-aged, straight man defend, uh, claim that he's being excluded from the <laughs> The sheer gall. I can see my Pakeha man. Seems very inclusive. <laughs> On the wrap-up, uh, we've had some interestingly compelling arguments on both sides about museum inclusivity around the country. So we're going to take a super quick vote now. Um, on which team you think reigns supreme? I think there's probably a little bit of interchange between them, but that's okay. <laughs> Please put your hands together or in the air if you believe the affirmative team have come out on top. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah, the volume. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now let us know if you reckon the negative bunch have swayed you. Absolutely amazing. So please put your hands together one last time.